Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church of Bennington, Vermont. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us this morning. Uh, whether you're here on this chilly, frosty October morning in person or whether you're watching on the delayed broadcast on CAT TV or online, uh, we hope that you will be blessed by and benefit from our time together in God's word, singing together, praying together. And so we want to welcome you. For any who might not know me, I'm Dr. Alan Ingalls. Uh, I teach at uh, Northeastern Baptist College, and my wife and I are members here of this church. It's always a delight for uh, me to be able to bring you the word of God on a Sunday morning. Uh, just a, a preview, next Sunday morning we'll have a student uh, from the college who will be here preaching for us, and I've heard really good things about his preaching. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing him myself, and I'm sure you will enjoy him as well. Uh, we want to begin with our music meditation. Our music meditation is a time for us to kind of pull in and push away the distractions of the world and, and focus our hearts and our minds on worshiping the Lord and to do that in spirit and in truth, as Jesus said himself. So we want to take time now for the music meditation. And this is also a good time for us if, if we realize we've got some, some unconfessed sin to deal with, to so just do that silently in our hearts as we listen. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21 through 25. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. Let's pray. Father, we, as we come to worship you this morning, we do desire to worship you, to worship in spirit and truth, to remind one another of your goodness and your greatness, that we might live more fully for you today, tomorrow, this week. In the days to come, we pray that as we, as we sing, as we pray, as we study your word, that 
all that is said and done in this service would bring glory and honor to you in your great name. For these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 311. Hymn number 311. You may stand with me if you wish. Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 62, the psalm that we will be looking at more closely in a few moments. To the choir master, according to Jedithon, a psalm of David. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him, like a leaning wall or a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is in him. He only is my rock and my salvation. My fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rest my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. 
Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances, they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render to a man according to his work. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. It's time now for our offertory. This is a time for us to think about what God has done for us. Uh, we don't pass the plate. However, we do have a plate down at the front. Many of us take the opportunity on our way in to, to drop our offerings in, but perhaps you haven't had time to think about what God would have you to do to support his work and his ministry in this place. So this is a time for us to think about what God has done for us and to worship through giving. Mm -hmm. seated. Let's take some time to pray, to pray for our, ourselves, our families, our church, our community, our nation. Uh, you'll notice that Leslie's not here this morning. Uh, amen. We pray together the model prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Uh, we want to sing uh, another song before uh, we come to the uh, sermon this morning. Um, and the song that we had picked out um, is one that, uh, that Leslie introduced, introduced us to in the spring. And, and there's the rub. Um, she's not here this morning to help us out. And neither Charlie nor I know the melody well enough uh, to carry it. So uh, Charlie and I put our heads together and we, we have chosen uh, hymn number 331. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. So we'll be singing uh, hymn number 331. 
sometimes we, we joke in ministry that the, the motto of pastors is Semper Gumby. <laughs> Always flexible. So let's sing together hymn number 331. You can stand with me if you wish. seated. We're kind of in between series right now. We finished Colossians and Philemon uh, a short time ago, and we're about to start our, our Advent series uh, in December. And so for October and no November, the, the weeks that I'm preaching, uh, I thought we would look at some psalms that talk about longing for God. Do you long for God? Do you crave God's presence? Do you, do you desire to spend time with him? Do, when things go bad, do you wait for him? Or you just say, well, okay, I guess I'm on my own. Uh, I better do something. You know, our tendency as humans is to do that, isn't it? To, to rush in where angels fear to tread. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm prone to doing that. I don't like to wait. I don't have much patience. And I know better than to pray for patience because you know what happens when you pray for patience. 
You get trials to teach your patients. Now, let's not do it that way. I know better than that. Waiting upon the Lord. Actually, this psalm seems to me, as I, as I was studying it, almost seems to be an Advent psalm. You think about it. That first Christmas, they had been without the word of God for 400 years. No prophets to speak to the people. Perhaps some individuals had received a word in particular situations. We, we know, you know, for example, that Simeon knew from the Lord that he would live to see the Lord's Messiah. But everyone waited. The Messiah had been promised. What could they do? In those 400 years, they had to go back to the promises of God and say, God said this was going to happen. We don't know when, but we'll wait. This psalm, I think, is a, is a good psalm for those kinds of situations. And so I think it, it's, it's almost kind of a pre-Advent sermon. Can, can we do that? I'm not sure if that's legitimate or not. Let's take a look at Psalm 62. Psalm 62, the, the superscription is to the choir master, according to Jedithan, a Psalm of David. To the choir master, many Psalms begin to the choir master. It, it, was, it was the practice of those writing music to apparently deposit their, their works with the, the choir master of the temple so that they could be used and reused by others. Sometimes we look at the superscription of a psalm and it, it talks about a particular situation that the psalmist was going through and, and yet the, the situation uh, doesn't seem to, to match what's in the psalm because the psalm is broader and more general than the specific situation that the psalmist was facing. And I believe that was deliberate. It, they, would, they would write their songs to be adaptable to others with similar kinds of needs, but maybe not exactly the same situation. So, to the choir master suggests to us that this, this song was, was written for communal worship. It was written to be used in the temple. Some have suggested perhaps when you, you brought your offering into the Lord and, and you, you didn't know quite what to say. You, would, you might ask for a particular song. Say, that's the one that, that fits how I feel bringing this offering today. And the Levitical singers around there could dust off that song and, and sing it. According to Jadathan, oh my goodness, what does that mean? in my professional opinion. I don't know. We're not sure. We don't know if this was a person's name, if this was a certain style of music or instrumentation, if it's a musical term. We're not quite sure what that means. Obviously, those who first received this song knew what that meant and knew how to use it appropriately. And as 21st century Christians, we just scratch our heads and go, okay, you know, when we get to heaven, we'll find out. A Psalm of David, written by David. We don't know what situation this was in David's life. Uh, the, the, the Psalm seems to talk about enemies who who dislike him, who oppose him because of his position. Maybe this was written after he became king. And there are those who wish to bring him down. Perhaps it was even before he became king, but had been designated to be the new king. And others are trying to undermine that and prevent, maybe prevent him from reigning as God had promised. We're not sure. Something in the life of David prompted this psalm.
we have a refrain in verses 1 and 2, and then again in verses 5 and 6. Very, very similar refrains. So it kind of divides the psalm into two parts, verses 1 through 4, and then 5 through the end of the psalm. So we'll break the psalm down in that way. In the first part of the psalm, David says he trusts the Lord in spite of his difficult predicament. Trust through the troubles, in spite of the troubles. Verses 1 and 2, he focuses on his statement of trust. And this is the first refrain. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. When, when we are in trouble, we often don't want to go with God alone. It's God and whatever we can do to think we can get ourselves out of it, don't we? We do that so often. And yet, David knew his only hope of dealing with this situation was God. And he waited. It's an intriguing line. In Hebrew, it's, it's literally, silently, my soul. I think the, the translations that we have today is, are right. He's saying that he waited in silence. He waited in peace. He waited calmly. He waited undisturbed. How do we usually wait? If we have to wait, we're just chomping at the bit. We're in turmoil. We're in conflict. When I make up my mind to do something, I want to do it right now. You, you've probably heard the, the saying, you know, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. <clears throat> Oh, we just talked about praying for patience. My soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He knows that God will deliver him. It's the only possible source of salvation for him is God, and God will save when he's ready. He repeats that again in the next line. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. Salvation, rock, salvation, fortress. God is his protector. That's the idea of the rock and the fortress. Now you think about it, with, with the kinds of weapons that they had in, in that day, if they could get into a rock fortress or into, you know, even a rocky place where they had some protection, what kind of weapon could hurt them? Swords, spears, arrows, sling stones. When, when two armies came together, the, the long-range artillery were the sling stones and the arrows. Those are easily defeated by a fortress. Sword? Yeah, you just try hitting a stone with a sword. Your sword won't last long. Spear? Same thing. So for the, for the psalmist, for the, for the ancients, to say that God was their rock, their fortress, their refuge, which he'll use the term refuge here in a moment, to say that God is, is their protection, their shield. Salvation and refuge. Salvation and fortress. He can wait calmly. He can wait patiently. He can wait undisturbed because he knows that God will protect him and will deliver him. 
What a statement of faith. This psalm is, is kind of an unusual psalm. It has elements of lament to it. He's obviously in a predicament. And yet he never really asks God to deliver him. He just states calmly, I know God will deliver me. I know God will protect me. I can wait. I know it will, it will come. So his statement of trust in verses 1 and 2, and then in, in verses 3 and 4, he describes, even confronts, his enemies. And here we learn what the trouble is, what, what kind of enemies he has. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall or a tottering fence? So in verse 3, he addresses his enemies directly. And you can kind of feel his frustration in, in what he says. You know, why do you keep doing this to me? How long is this going to go on? How long will you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall or a tottering fence? You know, you think that I'm weak. You think that you can just mow me over. You can knock me down. When I, when I worked as an electrician years ago, uh, we sometimes had to do some demo, a little demolition. I remember one particular case, we had, we had, school had bought a building. I, I worked for Dallas Seminary. They had bought a building and they were going to, you know, clean it up, rework it. And, and part of that building was actually a building within a building because what they had done is somebody had built a small building and then they'd come along later and instead of adding onto the building, they built a bigger building over it, encasing the old building. What a mess. Wires, pipes everywhere, walls within walls within walls. So we had to, one of the first things we had to do is go in and rip out that inner shell and get it out of there so that we could work with that space. Tell you what, yeah, demolition's easy. You don't like that, that wall? Give me a hammer. I'll take it out for you. Do you need to keep any of the wood? No? Great, it's gonna come out as toothpicks. You take the sledgehammer to it. Demolition is easy. Building is hard. Because you have to take your time and do it right and line everything up and make sure everything's square and make sure everything's plumb. So how do you attack a leaning wall or a tottering fence? You want to take them down? No problem. Give me a sledgehammer. We'll get that out of there. He says, that's the way they're attacking me. They're just going at it thinking that that I'm weak, thinking that I can't stand, thinking they can take me down quick. Then he describes them, the third person in verse 4, they only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. See, they don't like the fact that he has a high position whether he's been designated to be the king or whether he's the new king. That annoys them. Hey, hey, have you ever been in a company where someone gets promoted and, and all of a sudden his coworkers, this person's coworkers or subordinates suddenly are just, uh, the claws are out because they don't like that he got the promotion. That seems to be the kind of situation here. They're, they're out to get him. Not physically. I mean, this isn't a, a, a physical attack. You know, they, they take pleasure in falsehood. Inwardly, they curse. This is verbal. It sounds like they're spreading rumors. They're saying bad things about him. They're trying to undercut his his authority, they're trying to ruin his reputation. And the sad part is, th these aren't, aren't people he would expect to be his enemies. They bless with their mouths. These are people who, who outwardly speak well of him, 
who smile when they see him and say, congratulations. They're people that, that he thinks or should think are his friends, his supporters, and behind his back, they're cutting him down. Betrayal. You ever been betrayed? Oh, that hurts. Somebody you thought was your friend and you find out they're behind the problems? That's what David is dealing with. So we come now to the second part of the psalm. We begin again with the refrain. Verses 5 and 6 are very similar to verses 1 and 2. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. This time he doesn't say, I do wait in silence. He instructs himself when the psalmist talks about his soul. O oh my soul, he's addressing himself. He's, he's reminding himself, admonishing himself. Wait in silence. It's a form of the same word used in verse 1, to wait quietly without disturbance, to wait peacefully, quietly, patiently. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. In verse 1, he said, from him comes my salvation. He substitutes hope here. But it's entirely appropriate. You think about this psalm. He has hope. The word is, is, this, is the word that's used uh, in, in the national anthem of Israel. The national anthem of Israel is Hatikvah, the hope. And that's the word that's used here. My hope is from him. The confident expectation that God will, in fact, deliver him. For hope in, in Scripture is not, oh, you know, I hope it don't rain today. Well, according to the weather, it's not going to rain today. Hope here is the confident expectation that God will, in fact, deliver him. He returns to the idea of salvation at the beginning of verse 6. He only is my rock, my salvation, my fortress. He comes back to, to some of the same terms he used in verse 2. God will protect him. God will save him. And as a result, he will not be greatly shaken or he will not be shaken. He, he uses greatly in verse 2 but does not use greatly in verse 4. So he's, he's not repeating the exact same words from verses 1 and 2, but the same basic ideas. He is confident that God will help him, that God will save him, that God will deliver him. While in verses 3 and 4 he talks about his foes in verses 7, through 12, he begins to instruct his listeners. So if you're following my story, friends, here's what you need to do. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Just as I put my trust in God, I, I wait on him. He is my refuge. He is my salvation. I know he will protect me. I know he will help me. He will deliver me. He will save me. You can do the same thing, friends. 
In fact, you should. Trust in him at all times. Isn't that what the whole psalm is about? Trust is just another word for waiting patiently for God's help. For hope, for confidence. He trusts God. Pour out your heart before him. Probably talking about prayer. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Have you ever met someone who stopped praying? They, 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 were, they had lost their confidence in the Lord so much that they, just, they didn't even bother praying anymore. That's sad. Then you know they're really in trouble. If a person is saying, I, I, I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm praying, great, they're, they're still okay. They're hurting, yes. They're waiting, they're in trouble, but they're still praying. Pour out your heart before him. And he talks about those enemies that the enemies can't stand. They're, they're but a breath. They're a delusion. In the balances, they go up. They are lighter than a breath. He uses this word breath twice in this verse, and it's the same word used in Ecclesiastes for vanity. Emptiness, purposelessness, uselessness. The picture is, is of a balanced scale. You, you'd put the item that you're weighing out on one pan, and you would put standardized weights in the other until you got it to balance, and then you would know the weight of what you had in this pan. I mean, imagine, these people are so light that you don't even put anything in the other pan and they go up. They're empty, they're useless, they're purposeless. They are all hot air. They're trying to undercut his position, undercut his his, could I say ministry, his job, his role, but they're nothing. Ultimately, they are empty. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hope on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. You know, they're using lies and they're using probably pressure. I mean, do, isn't that what people usually do when they're trying to undercut someone? They begin to pressure other people to try and persuade them to participate in their rebellion, to undercut someone. In that pressure, they may use extortion, they may use robbery, they may use threats. But the psalmist says, that, that's nothing. Don't put your hope in those kinds of things because ultimately they will be judged. That's what he says next. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this. He's saying, I'll tell you again and again. I've, I've told you before what I tell my, my Hebrew students. Repetition is the mother of learning. I've told you once, I'll tell you again. Let me repeat this over so you don't miss it. Get this. Power belongs to God. And to you, O oh Lord, belongs steadfast love. Power and faithful love. This is the word chesed that we, we've seen before in, in passages. It's a hard word to translate, but it has the idea of, of loyalty and love together. God is a God of power and a God of love. For you will render to a man according to his work. These enemies of David's are going to get theirs in the end. 
They cannot accomplish their purpose because God is strong. God is able and God is loyal. And he is confident to the core of his being that God will help him out. And so as a result, he says in 1 and 5, in silence, I wait for God alone. He can wait quietly, undisturbed, because of his hope, his trust, his confidence in God's goodness. Longing for God. When you're in trouble, you, you want it to be over right now. And our tendency is to be all wound up and agitated. And the psalmist says, you don't need to do that. Just wait for God. Continue longing for him. It will come in his time when he's ready. Marvelous psalm. Lots to think about there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this message from David. David, who, who surely endured many troubles and trials in the days leading up to his kingship and even as a king. We pray that you will help us in the days to come to take his example to heart, to wait patiently for you, to wait silently in trust, in faith, in hope. For these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 322. Hymn number 322, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Let's stand together as we sing.
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Amen. Any announcements as we close? Okay. Lakula Shalom. Go in peace.